Sometimes it happens in life that you meet somebody who inspires you to an extent that it sort of shapes up your future. I met this person in the year 1997, in the month of October, when I qualified for the DM entrance exam of uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I was then a resident at SGPGI and I was carrying a message uh, from SGPGI for this gentleman. Uh, I found this gentleman on the seventh floor in room number 707, which I eventually occupied. And uh, when I entered this room, number 707, I saw this uh, gentleman with a towering personality. He was clad in a white shirt, a very gaudy designer tie and suspenders. I was hugely inspired by this gentleman and I am till date, whom we all know today as Dr. Satish Jain, a neurologist par excellence, a world famous epileptologist and a great human being by nature. Ladies and gentlemen, by, uh, with the uh, a, a proud moment for me to present today the show of the legends of Indian Academy of Neurology with my mentor, my guide, my uh, idol, Professor Satish Jain. Today we will learn something about Dr. Satish, which everybody knows, something which very few people know, and something which nobody knows. Welcome, Dr. Satish Jain, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Sumit, uh, for the kind words. I, I never thought that, uh, you know, uh, someone could take uh, things so seriously. Uh, but I'm very happy with you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be interviewed by you, uh, because uh, there are certain things that we share which many people don't know. And uh, I don't know if you are aware or not, if I were to interview you, you probably will get a lot of surprises. So be <laughs> careful uh, when you ask me uh, some questions. Yes, sir. You never know when I get a chance to interview you. Yeah, that would be very interesting, sir. So uh, I will begin with a brief introduction. Now, you know, the difficult most part is to introduce somebody whom everybody knows. So I will try to do justice as much as I can. So I'll be sharing my screen to give a brief overview of what Dr. Jain is. Uh, and as I continue to uh, sort of uh, present the bio data or his uh, life history, there would be many interesting photographs like this one where I don't know what he's doing, but it appears to be that he's enjoying himself in probably some desert area. And this is probably the, uh, probably the end of the country, probably the highest point or probably the uh, terminal end of the country. So I will be uh, sort of uh, presenting uh, his journey across his life in terms of his achievements. So Dr. Satish Jain was born on June 18th, 1955 at Karnal in India. He got married in 1977 and has currently got two children and correct me, sir, uh, three grandchildren. Yeah. Three grandchildren. Uh, his hobbies are Indian classical music, travel and social work. So his, uh, when I look at his bio data, it was about a 40 page bio data. So it was impossible to sort of read out everything. Otherwise, the show would have ended. So I, he got his graduation with distinction from Punjab Police School, Nabha. And then uh, he did his MBBS from uh, Medical College, Rohtak. Then he was a resident in internal medicine at Medical College, Rohtak in 1978 to 81. And uh, then a senior resident in neurology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And then he received his FRCP in Glasgow in the year 2006. So, sir, uh, my first discussion about would about you would be your schooling, your early education, the MBBS, MD, and DM. May I remind you that in 1965 to 70, uh, he got the Government of India Merit Scholarship for study in the Punjab Public School, Nabha, graduated with distinction. He was placed on the merit list of top 20 students of the Punjab University. There are several awards which he got in uh, MBBS and in MD. Then he got his DM and then he had his uh, DM exams and then he joined DAMES. So I would like to uh, learn about your journey in this vast, uh, 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 in this vast duration. 
of your end of schooling till your DM exam? See, early life uh, was not easy. See, we were born in an India which had uh, just been, uh, you know, partitioned. Uh, and, you know, we got the so-called independence. And everywhere we could see the effects of the trauma of partition. And my father was uh, working with the Indian Railways. Uh, and his sole aim in life was to... Uh, get us good education. Uh, we have three brothers. So I don't know how he decided to put me in a boarding school, uh, you know, coming from a background uh, which was a very average uh, middle class background. Uh, and in, in 1964, when I was selected in the school, uh, this was started by Mr. Pratap Singh Caro, and he wanted, uh, you know, a school on the lines of uh, uh, Eton or Harrow, uh, you know, where, where children of ordinary people could go and get educated uh, on the same pattern. So when I got admission, uh, you know, the, the monthly fee of that school was more than uh, my father's salary. So, you know, I could have never made it, uh, you know, there. Uh, it was just because of the scholarship. Uh, many people may not even be aware that there was a scholarship uh, for uh, people to study in uh, residential public schools and it exists even today i believe so my everything was covered uh, by that scholarship including uh, my travel in a first class compartment along with a uh, oddly uh, pn who used to leave me home during my vacations and uh, my clothes my food uh, sort of everything was covered you know we, we didn't have to pay anything that is luxury only... sir yeah, it was a luxury, but, you know, there was a rider to it that uh, every exam, every semester, uh, you know, every term, I had to score more than 60% because the oh. moment you go down below 60%, the scholarship stops. So that was a forced kind of thing for me to really put in, uh, you know, good effort uh, and, and get, get good grades. And uh, after that, uh, you know, uh, since the foundation was laid, uh, in a very different kind of atmosphere, uh, you know, those who have not been to a boarding school cannot imagine uh, the difference between a boarding school and a day school. And some of my teachers uh, who are still alive, you know, we are still in touch with them. They still remember everything about us. My housemaster, my Hindi teacher and my English teacher, uh, my chemistry teacher, you know, we, we are regularly in touch even now. They're all in 90s. And uh, wonderful human beings, and they, they really went uh, out of the way to look after us, uh, and even to the extent of ignoring their own children, uh, which I, I feel sad about sometimes. Then after that was college, uh, DV college. Where sir, 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 we, we need to know more about your schooling. So what was your favorite subject in your school? And were you a routine type of a student or a, a, a mastermind of sorts? or a, trouble to the teacher's thoughts like i remember my schooling i used to dread mathematics chemistry and physics i used to pray to god let 10th end so that this uh, stuff oh, ends. See, none of the subjects was a real problem uh, excepting in the beginning maybe english you know because this was uh, a boarding school run on uh, british public school lines and our entire syllabus everything was uh, from uh, the university of cambridge local syndicate so, you know, we, we really had to study the, the British English and uh, the literature. And uh, coming from a Hindi medium background, you know, in the beginning, first few years, that was a real problem. But uh, gradually, yes, we, we did get adjusted. And uh, we had some teachers who were Britishers. Our uh, senior master in the school was a Second World War veteran, Mr. Cowell who was a very strict uh, man with discipline, you know, he, he couldn't tolerate any nonsense from anyone. So uh, we, we really were brought up there and in that school life was totally different because, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing really called studying. Uh, you know, we used to have fun and uh, everyday games and uh, every season different game. Uh, we had to do swimming, play cricket, football, hockey, uh, you know, do athletics and uh, take part in debates and all those things and uh, you know the boarding houses uh, the different shows and plays 
extracurricular activities, you name it, you know. But, uh, you know, there were lots of uh, rich uh, background, sick people there, uh, you know, the, or the farming background or the defense background people. Those guys used to excel in sports. And we were the guys who would excel in uh, studies. So not that we didn't play sports or not that uh, they were uh, very poor in studies, but, you know, this was the basic division that, uh, you know, uh, the, the studious, so-called studious guys would excel in uh, studies and uh, the others guys will take care of sports. And, uh, and going by the aggression in the sports, you know, those were the real aggressive guys and, uh, you know, what you call uh, typical... Uh, uh, to some extent, little bullies uh, in a boarding school. And uh, we were the sort of mostly on the receiving end, uh, you know, in those days. But it was good fun. And uh, we, uh, I have sweet memories, uh, you know, of many seven years stay in uh, the palatial buildings of Maharaja of Nabha. You know, the entire uh, official buildings of Maharaja of Nabha were donated to the school. And uh, it was a totally different experience for me, you know, coming from a very ordinary family and landing in a palace uh, kind of thing. And uh, then staying there with servants all around and, uh, you know, eating in a British way and fork and knife. And, uh, you know, uh, many times, you know, we used to call it okay. uh, English food once or twice a week. So, and was getting a 60% marks a challenge? Yes, it was a big challenge in, th uh, in those days uh, because 60% uh, was not easy and uh, our, our teachers were very strict. And I, I still remember our chemistry teacher, Mr. Bhave, he lives in Pune now. Uh, he had a set of equations, uh, you know, uh, which you had to mug up uh, to begin with. And those were 101 equations. And uh, then suddenly he would ask us to write those down. And uh, then he would say, okay, you correct yourself, each, uh, you know, uh, each other you correct. And if there were 50 mistakes, then next day you were supposed to write the entire equation 50 times and bring it to the class. And he would then just put a big dustbin there and he says, okay, throw them there. So, you know, he was that strict. And, uh, but, you know, that uh, made us really, and then he would, once you memorize it, then he would make you understand everything. And I never saw that guy using a blackboard. Uh, and, and believe me, uh, our chemistry results were uh, the best ever uh, uh, you know, all over India. And I still remember those equations, uh, you know. So uh, it was uh, it was different. We were in a very protected atmosphere. That was uh, one major drawback. Uh, now I realize of the school because the moment we came out and went into college, you know, we yeah. faced a lot of problems. Yeah. And their life was difficult and uh, you had to be on your own and, uh, you know, all those things. But fortunately, I, I was in DB College and based on uh, my marks in the senior Cambridge, you know, I got scholarships again. So my entire uh, pre-medical, again, I didn't pay any money to the college, books, everything uh, was free. The only thing I had to manage was uh, living in a hostel. And there I got a chance. Yeah, this is very important. You know, I, I got a, I, I couldn't survive in a DB college hostel. It was too crowded. So I, I revolted. I said, I'm not going to stay here. So uh, Chandigarh has uh, a Ramakrishna Mission Ashram. And they had a boys hostel there. And I liked that place. Nice open place. I, I could get a room to myself. And uh, the Swamiji there had come to our school to give a talk. So the moment uh, he, when he was interviewing me and he said, you are from PPS Nava, he said, oh, you are selected immediately. I know your school and uh, I, I, I can imagine your background. So that one year uh, which I spent in Ramakrishna Mission, I think was uh, the, the basic foundation of my life. And uh, I, I, I was forced not to study too much by Swamiji. And he would ask me to spend my free time in the ashram, helping him out and... Uh, you know, helping with his guests and visitors and all that. And I got a lot of time to read in the library. So I got to read a lot about uh, Vivekanand, Ramakrishna and Vedanta. And uh, I, I somehow did reasonably well in uh, the pre-medical exam also, uh, despite not having uh, put in so much effort. And uh, I learned 
personal interaction with Swamiji, I learned a lot of things and uh, which I still follow in my life today. To the extent that after uh, school, uh, uh, you know, between uh, somewhere, I had uh, told my father, I said, listen, I want to go around all over India. And this is, I was 15 and a half at that time. My father being in railways, I said, get me a free pass, which I'm entitled to. And uh, I want to tour India. So all those uh, other people were still preparing for some preparatory exam, but I decided to go around India. And uh, there was a lot of opposition, but I still managed somehow. And they didn't give me money. Uh, my mother, uh, my parents gave me only 50 rupees. And they thought uh, that he will not be able to survive. But, you know, I, I was out of uh, my home for almost six weeks. And I traveled all the way to Mumbai, then Pune, then um, Bangalore, Mysore, then uh, Chennai, then Rameshwaram, then Trivandrum, Madurai, Tricharapalli, uh, you know, uh, and, and maybe a few other places. And then I came back and, uh, uh, you know, when I came back, I, I still had some money with me. So this is probably where the, your WhatsApp updates come from, where I see you today in this place and tomorrow at different places. And probably uh, it is Swamiji who instilled this nature of going to bed early and sleep and uh, getting uh, early in the morning. Because I've seen several times that you are up and about it very early in the morning and sleep very early in the evening. Yeah, I think, I think those uh, genetic changes occurred, you know, mutations occurred in school. <laughs> because that uh, Britisher, Mr. Cobble, uh, you know, uh, he, uh, the lights out in school boarding used to be at nine o'clock. And the morning bell used to be there, rouser, we used to call it at 5.20 in summers and 5.40 in winters. So that 5.20 has become 5 or 4.30 now. And 9 might have become 9.30 or so, but, you know, it still stays. And uh, I never need a um, alarm or something to wake up. Uh, my standard time nowadays is 4.30 in the morning. And uh, the first reply is that, uh, you know, if I have to reply to some messages, is 5 o'clock. Yes. A lot of people uh, do receive messages at that time. and uh, But it's good, uh, you know, I really believe that, yes, early to bed, early to rise uh, makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. And uh, then, so when did this idea of becoming a doctor instilled in your mind? Oh, that's, uh, yeah. That was not my idea. I never wanted to be a doctor. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I begged my father, uh, you know, because in the school I had both uh, in those days uh, what we call higher maths, physics, chemistry, biology. So mm -hmm. we were, uh, you know, in, in that group. So I, I got admission to Bits Pilani. I got admission to Indian School of Mines, Dhanbad. And I got admission to IIT Kharagpur. Oh, wow. But uh, my father was insistent that, you know, I have to do pre-medical and get into medicine. So, there, uh, then during that time, you know, uh, after school, I thrice cleared uh, the NDA exam. And I went for the SSB, uh, both for Army, Navy, Air Force, all three, uh, you know. But my father would never allow me to join Army. That was my first interest, but I could never do it. And uh, then after that, uh, you know, uh, when we went for pre-medical, I, I begged him, I said, listen, I want to do simple BA and I want to compete for the civil services. Uh, you know, he said, nothing doing these uh, uh, civil services people, they live a life which is, uh, you know, uh, very bad and there's too much political interference. And he always believed in that, that they don't have a good life. He said, nothing doing, you're not going to do that. And uh, so he put me in pre-medical and after that, again, uh, you know, I was selected for AFMC and, and I joined there in KBATCH, uh, you know, stayed there for about 10-15 days. Then he brought me back to Rotak and I never went, went back to AFMC. Yeah. So that was more of, I think, destiny also. I was not destined to be in, uh, in the defense services, but uh, at heart, you know, I am I'm more than 50% Fauji, you know, all my habits, everything, uh, you know, it's all Fauji's and... 20 of my school batchmates uh, went to the defense services, uh, 20 out of 59, which was a very high percentage. And uh, it was, it was uh, you know, mostly my father's insistence and uh, maybe it was destined for me. So what do, what do you remember as uh, the best part of your MBBS and the not very best part of MBBS? That is the first question which comes to my mind straight away. 
and the second one is blended neurology instead okay i think the best part of mbbs was again uh, you know living in a boarding you know in a hostel so you know i was so used to it you know i went to hostel in 1964 and i joined the medical college in 72 so whole my life i was in a hostel so i used to enjoy i used to have fun and i used to play games and and do all sorts of extracurricular activities and there uh, in in 73 we staged uh, 72 and 73 we staged a play for the youth festivals where uh, mainka and i were together in the culture club so you know uh, that that's how we met each other and uh, in in fact before uh, we even got engaged you know uh, there was a, in that play we we did a role of a husband and wife and uh, so you that, did some practice before you actually went into that uh, it was it was not practice it was theory <laughs> <laughs> so you know uh, that that was a great part that you know you you could uh, have uh, a girlfriend in those days and, and still be in a professional college uh, you know it provided that opportunity and uh, of course uh, you know i, I did have uh, other uh, friends also uh, you know but you know when you get stuck to one then uh, you know you really you cannot have more in those days <laughs> so that was good and the the worst part was uh, you know uh, i'm sorry to say you know the attitude of teachers uh, in those days the general attitude i you know not with me personally i i i enjoyed my life but the general attitude uh, towards every student in in a medical college was not good and uh, everywhere the students would be rebuked and you know the the, the teaching was fairly good but most of the people would not understand the terms and english and you know what was told in the lecture theater and uh, you know uh, small diagrams made on the blackboard and i i i failed to understand how anyone can understand embryology and other things by small diagrams on the blackboard you know in those days so uh, i think the teachers were uh, perhaps, perhaps having that kind of attitude more because people would work and you know, they knew that uh, the students come from different backgrounds they they wanted them to learn but uh, i think the facilities in those days were not not really up to the mark you know uh, like the the technology you have now and uh, you know from cunningham dissectors uh, seeing those pictures uh, hand drawn pictures to to virtually now you can see almost anything and understand that so uh, I, i think now the the, the students are, are much better off uh, but uh, still the respect for teachers we had in those days was perhaps different as compared to now uh, i don't know how much interaction the undergraduate students have uh, with the teachers then when com- uh, coming later on you know after my mbbs uh, you know of course in those days uh, the thing was that the, all the boy toppers would go to medicine and the girls would go to gynae or at the most uh, you know pediatrics was a, a common thing you know where boys and girls both could go you know so you know just just by by, by the, the grades and all that you know i had to join medicine there was uh, just a trend going on and uh, in medicine then you know you were allocated uh, your wards or uh, your you know the units and i got attached to dr c prakash and then dr b c bansal now dr b c bansal was uh, interested in neurology and he had done a commonwealth fellowship and all that so right from day one you know uh, in my house job uh, i was seeing uh, epilepsy 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 and in, in in those days it was very interesting we had some neurology performers which we had to fill for every patient dr bc bansal really taught me how to maintain records and every patient with epilepsy you know would be investigated uh, including csf examination uh, oh. i don't know why it was done csf in every patient with epilepsy every patient every patient of epilepsy we had to do a csf examination and the treatment was only uh, you know aptine and luminal there was no third drug 
carbamazepine came in much later, but it was not really available. It was very expensive, and because of the potential side effects, it was not in much use. Anyone who had a focal seizure, to, uh, focal onset uh, seizure, you know, we had to investigate, uh, you know, for a cause, and uh, the, the investigation was neck puncture, carotid artery. Oh. So I learned uh, neck punctures uh, in my in my second house job. That is a senior house surgeon. You know, I started doing neck punctures, and uh, in fact, during my uh, PG time, I still remember one day one of the medical students. He probably had uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage in the hostel, and he, he sort of he was very sick. He collapsed, and the hostel he was brought to the hospital. He was admitted, and I was just sort of preparing myself for my MD exam. So I was in a furlough kind of thing. But, uh, you know, after one or two days, the boy didn't improve and uh, they saw some hemorrhages in the fundus. So they called me, that he angio to Were you paid at the time um, when you are doing MD? Uh, yes. Uh, initially, uh, as a simple MD student, we were paid 600 rupees. Okay. But uh, because of my merit and all that, in the second year, I, I got registrarship. So, you know, that time we were paid around uh, 1290 or something as a registrar. Uh, you know, it was big money. Uh, so, yeah, so, you're talking about the SAH. Yes, yeah, that was very interesting. Now, this boy was practically brain dead. And I punctured his neck. I injected the contrast. And we took picture on a CM, you know, uh, arterial phase, then uh, capillary and venous phase. And the dye would just go up to this place and there was nothing else. So, ek bar, do bar, teen bar, then I punctured the other side, you know, udar inject kia, and then five, six times I injected. And ultimately, I said, listen, you know, we can't see anything beyond the carotids. I don't know what's happening and this is what it is. So on a brain dead person, I did angiogram, but I never knew what I was doing. Mm. And I, I never knew the interpretation of, uh, you know, uh, what an angiogram would look like in a brain dead person. Of course, uh, that un, uh, unlucky boy didn't survive. We didn't have any other facilities there. But uh, that's how, you know, I, I started. And uh, then it was uh, only Dr. B.C. Bansal, uh, you know, uh, since I was a registrar. Uh, so. Uh, during my post MD days, there was a camp uh, in uh, near Faridabad. So I was posted as uh, in the camp for the whole duration, you know, uh, about 10 days. So after the intensive three days, everyone went away and we were there and we had nothing to do. So we used to go to this Badkal Lake and, you know, in the evening, enjoy a beer and swim and, uh, you know, then go back to, uh, you know, where we were staying in the camp. So one day I saw Dr. B.C. Bansal, you know. He came with a set of papers and I was swimming and he said, come out. And he had gone to my house, Xeroxed all my certificates and then brought them to Faridabad, got them signed. And then next day was the last date for applying to AIMS DM, uh, you know, entrance exam. Was there a competition at that time? Yes. Oh. So anyway, he applied and then, you know, uh, when the exam was there, there, there were 49 candidates in those days for one seat, one oh. open seat. And, and, you know, I got it. And, and, you know, how I got it, again, very interesting, you know, because uh, since I was with Dr. B.C. Bansal, in my MD, you know, I went for uh, the first NSI conference in Calcutta during my, as an MD student. And uh, we were put up in MLA hostel or somewhere, and I shared the room with Professor Desi Raju at that time. You know, I never knew who he was, how big a person he was. And uh, I troubled him a lot uh, without realizing who he is. And uh, But there we got a CME book, you know, uh, a thick book. I, I still have it somewhere. And in that were uh, some multiple choice questions. So that CME book was the only thing that I prepared from, uh, you know, for my DM entrance exam. And you will not believe the entire question paper was from those multiple choice questions. <laughs> so, I, so I scored 100%. <laughs> I, I, I topped in the DM entrance exam and uh, that's how 
I, I, I was selected. I'm very sure because it, it, only that could have done it. Right. So how was your DM, sir? At that time, where was the, the neurology department at AIDS and who were your teachers at that time? And yeah, how that did time, work out? Uh, neurology consist, consisted of two and a half people. Yeah. You know, Dr. Why Meshri, do Dr. Meshri was the head and Dr. Ahuja was number two. And then once in a while, uh, twice a week, we used to see Dr. Amitabh Verma. Oh. Uh, he was an ad hoc lecturer and, you know, he used to come once in a while and you know, do certain other things in his uh, other time. But uh, on, on Wednesday morning, uh, you know, he used to have his round. And Wednesday morning, we used to have an EEG class with Dr. Ahuja. So we used to see to it that Dr. Ahuja delays the class. Then we would go to the old cafeteria to have that cup of tea and little samosa. Mm. And by that time, we would go to the ward. You know, it was in uh, C4 and D4 in the main building. The, the duty room uh, used to be full of smoke because Amitabh uh, would wait there and get frustrated and smoke few cigarettes and uh, and then walk out of the ward and he says, many around Lunga and you are bloody, uh, you never come in time and those kind of things. And we never wanted uh, the round with him anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a very good arrangement. And uh, uh, so this was the faculty, the department was located where the current computer facility is. Okay. And uh, the CN was, Center was under construction at that time, sir? Yeah, CN Center construction started uh, in, in 83. And uh, the place where it, it is now, uh, in good old days, I think in that area, there used to be a cricket pitch where undergraduates would play cricket. You know, in that area was mostly for uh, sports activities of undergraduate students. And we shifted our uh, OPD first in uh, 84 or 85, I think. And then later on, we shifted the wards. But first we shifted the OPD and uh, uh, then the whole building came up. And uh, in, in our time, uh, the OPD used to be on the fourth floor in the main building. The EEG room also was fourth floor, 4080. We cannot forget that room number. EEG, EMG was uh, down there. And then our OPD was uh, in the extension uh, OPD block. And uh, then we came to this building and, you know, in, in those days, we, we used to have the morning round, then OPD was in the afternoon. And then the person who was on call, uh, you know, would be doing calls also in the casualty and uh, seeing patients in the OPD and responsible for routine admissions and emergency admissions and consultations. Mm -hmm. So when we shifted to the new building, we insisted that we must have our OPD in the morning. So that was one big thing we, which we achieved, you know, the, 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 uh, three days a week we would have OPD and uh, it was in the morning and cardiology shifted to afternoons. So, so what are your memories of your uh, exam, DM exam? I mean, the exit exam or the, uh, uh, the DM finals? Yeah, DM exam was very interesting. You know, uh, the, the, the first time I appeared in December 93, you know, I got a long case of uh, some sort of ataxia. He was a boy who was about uh, 13, 14 years old. And uh, his father ran away somewhere. So there was no one to give me the history. So, you know, it was a very sorry state of affairs. What should I do? First time, you know, you're in the exam. And the examiner was that time was Dr. Badia and uh, Dr. Uh, Reddy from uh, Hyderabad. Veera Gav Reddy. So I examined and I said, the father is not there. I don't have the history and these are the findings and it looks some sort of ataxia. I cannot classify more than that. So obviously, you know, that was the end of my exam. You know, why did the father run away? This, that, blah, blah, blah. I said, listen, how do I control? I don't even know who the father is. I have not seen him. So anyway, uh, then what happened that uh, next time, uh, in May 84, uh, Dr. Reddy fell sick. So, you know, and then at the last moment, they had to get hold of Dr. Baldev Singh as uh, the external examiner. So, Dr. Vadia and Dr. Baldev Singh were my examiners, which is a very unique combination. I think only Bora shares this with me. Uh, nobody else was ever examined by these people together because by the time Vadia started, you know, Dr. Baldev Singh had retired. 
Okay. Or initially. So anyway, then second time when uh, the exam was there, Dr. Vadia talked to me after. He said, you are so much improved that, you know, first time I was happy that I failed someone, you know, in, in my life. I said, sir, koi mauka hai nahi mila first time, bolne ka to kya improve ho, kya nahi hai. Anyway, he said, no, I'm still happy that, you know, you, you have done so well in your exam. Hmm. And uh, then what happened that, you know, uh, one year later, Dr. Roger Rosenberg was visiting uh, India and different places in the world looking for uh, Machado Joseph disease. Okay. Familiar literature. So Dr. Maheshwari uh, put me on the job. He says, you have to be with him. Uh, like, you know, when a president comes, you know, you have a minister uh, who's attending to the president. So he put me on the job. I was a deaf lecturer. And uh, we were uh, supposed to call some patients and admit them, you know, for his examination. So I called uh, two, three families uh, who had a definite family history and I got this boy also who was my long case uh, in December. And uh, Dr. Rosen, uh, Rosenberg, you know, he examined and he took some uh, pictures and all that. And then this boy had uh, prominent eyes. So okay. he says, uh, you know, uh, and there was some family history. The father was there at that time. He said, this looks like uh, my shadow Joseph disease to me. Then, uh, you know, as it happens in life, uh, the same year or next year, there was a workshop in NIH on uh, Machado, uh, Machado Joseph disease. And, you know, somehow, I don't know, I got the invitation to participate in that. So I ran around different places, you know, uh, with a photography unit and uh, got some uh, big, those uh, video cassettes, uh, you know, which were used for making documentaries <coughs> and films. And recorded all these patients and, you know, I, I took my videos uh, for presentation there. And uh, when I was uh, showing that boy's video, then Roger Rosenberg called, uh, got up. And he said, you know, this is one patient I saw there in India. And he looks like a shadow Joseph disease. And Dr. Vadia was also there. Oh. So, so now we come to the... Sorry, sir. Sorry. Then I told Dr. Vadia, I said, listen, Dr. Vadia, this is a patient. Do you remember? He said, yes. I said, I said it is some sort of ataxia and, and you know, I failed in the exam. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he, he appreciated, he said, Hota hai kabhi kabhi. I said, don't worry, but you know, you are a much better uh, clinician now. Uh, uh, and, uh, and maybe uh, that thing had not happened, you know, you wouldn't have been interested in ataxia. And in fact, that's how my interest in ataxia started and, you know, uh, sort of... Uh, we, uh, we, I really took it further, you know, uh, we can discuss that maybe a little later. Uh, yeah, so so that is what my next question would have been, uh, that probably that uh, debacle which happened about that ataxia patients with no family to give the history, was it the starting point of your interest in genetics, ataxias, and probably the ex extra exposure which you got during uh, your uh, graduation and your MD days with uh, Dr. Bansal, probably that instilled your uh, interest uh, in epilepsy. So Dr. Satish Jain was awarded with the prestigious William G. Leno uh, International Clinical Research Fellowship of the Epilepsy Foundation of America to work at the Duke Center for the Advanced Study of Epilepsy, Duke University Medical Center at Durham, NC, USA and also the Fulbright Scholarship for uh, of the Council of the International Exchange of Scholars, USA. And then uh, he, I remember it very, very distinctly about his meticulous recordings of uh, the family tree. And I still, uh, you know, tell my residents and my students that the only way by which you can understand a family tree is by drawing it. And I have no, you know, doubt in saying that uh, Dr. Jan was the one who told us how to draw a family tree, the importance of family history and the importance of uh, taking the family history in a very elaborate manner. So, uh, Dr. Jan, after you uh, were taken into your uh, job at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, how did it evolve that uh, you started developing this interest in all these uh, three things. And uh, I, I think uh, it was first epilepsy, then ataxias, and then genetics, or was it the other way out? I think it was first ataxias, uh, but then I soon realized that uh, with ataxias, uh, you know, I can't offer much uh, 
for treatment. And second was there was nothing really beyond a family history. You know, you could just then keep on uh, talking. This is uh, what type, that type. <coughs> Even the classification uh, on, on the based on the phenotype was not very well defined, you know, and and I'm sure many other candidates must have failed just because of this because the examiner thought something else and the candidate thought something else. So gradually, uh, then I shifted uh, my interest to epilepsy mainly because this was a treatable disorder, and around. Uh, 85, 86, uh, you know, we started the uh, preparation for the International Epilepsy Congress. Uh, I think we, we were allocated in 86 and uh, I was fortunate to be working with Dr. Maheshwari. You know, he relied a lot on me and uh, he gave me all the entire dirty work for this, uh, you know, uh, conference. But, uh, you know, I really grabbed it with both the hands and, uh, you know, correspondence, knowing people, you know, knowing the subject. And that way, you know, my, my interest really developed. And uh, the, the conference that we organized in 89, uh, you know, really I, I could interact personally with the top authorities in epilepsy in the world at that time as a very young person. Uh, you know, I was just an assistant professor. And uh, I still remember that the, first, the, the new classification of 1989, uh, for epilepsy, you know, was uh, finally uh, announced, uh, released in New Delhi during the conference. And at that time, I could never imagine that someday I will be part of the team that's going to announce uh, a new classification in 2017. Uh, so, you know, the, the journey started uh, mainly uh, uh, because it was a treatable condition. And then I'd seen lots of patients in Rotak, uh, you know, uh, although whatever was available at that time we used to treat. And, and yes, I learned uh, doing EEGs during that time because uh, Dr. Bansal, uh, we had an EEG machine, grass EEG machine there, which was only to be operated by the technician. Nobody else okay. could touch it, you know. So once in a while when the technician was away, so how the EEGs would be done? So during... Uh, you know, we had a big strike at there, you know. So during those days, I, I bought this book, Kilo Oselton, and uh, read it up and, you know, then started uh, knowing about the technology and all that, the basics. And this EG technician, I used to bribe him every day, take him out for tea or something or coke or whatever, so that he would allow me to fiddle with the EG machine. So, you know, with the cap on, uh, I could start placing the electrodes and all that. I knew what is 1020 system during my... Uh, how job uh, and uh, you know I actually started recording EEGs. Then uh, one day, what happened? Uh, you know, this this guy was not there, and Dr. B. C. Bansal had some private patient. He wanted the EEG to be done. So then I told him, I said, look, look, if you allow me, I can do it. He said, how the hell will you do it? I said, look, I'll do it. You give it to me. I didn't tell him that, you know, I, I, I touched the machine and all that. So I took the patient and uh, got the EG, brought the paper. Then he really looked at me and uh, he must have cursed inside ke how this fellow is doing EEGs. So he, he knew something was wrong. And uh, when that guy, Subramaniam, a technician, came back, I'm sure he got a big dose. But uh, that gave me the privilege of then doing EEGs, then learning EMG, nerve conduction. So during my house job and PG, you know, I was regularly doing all these things and that's how I, I landed up in neurology. But epilepsy started from there, 86, 87 and 89 conference. And then I got this fellowship. And uh, this also was, uh, 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 I think I was destined because the first time I applied for fellowship with uh, Dreyfus, uh, he was the, uh, you know, in, in 89, he was the president of the ILA. And he was in Charlottesville. I visited that place also. I spent uh, 10 days with him and, uh, you know, I got the fellowship. But somehow the ILA didn't get the funding for the fellowship. So, you know, I never got the money. And then Dreyfus, uh, unfortunately, he passed away. So the next year I again applied and this time, uh, you know, I got in touch with Jim McNamara at Duke. And we applied uh, to work on uh, JME and absence epilepsies, uh, you know, the hereditary thing. And uh, for my uh, travel and all, I got the Fulbright scholarship. 
Now, as it happened that this was a foreign money and uh, being an institute, I had to apply for permission. So my file went to the health ministry and one great undersecretary put an objection. So this is a foreign money and how can a government servant get foreign money? So, you know, I, I was refused that I will not get the full bread scholarship. So I was very upset. I said, Look, I can't go, you know. So I, I ran around and then I, I went to Shastri Bhavan. Uh, I, I talked to some people there and one of the directors there uh, said, look, this Fulbright scholarship is by definition for government employees who want to study abroad, especially in USA. And it's a collaborative thing. I said, can you show me some circular or something? So he gave me a copy of the government circular that government servants must be encouraged to apply for Fulbright scholarship and they must be encouraged given all leave and all that. So I took that circular and went to that under secretary. I listened and said, this is the circular. Within 24 hours, either give me the permission or then I'm going to report to the health secretary and whatever halla I can make, it will be in the press and all that. So he was shivering and sure enough, within 24 hours, he came to All India Institute to give me the letter that I can avail of the fellowship and go to US. So it was a hard way, but yes, then working with Jim McNamara and then I started constructing family pedigrees and all that. And, and it's, it's amazing what all this can do. I will just give you one example. Uh, there's a family known to me in Guwahati. So this lady who's around uh, about 65, 66, she was suspected to have uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus because of some difficulty in walking. And she was advised lumbar puncture and, you know, CSF study and all that. So they called me. I said, listen, it's an invasive procedure. Let's wait. And uh, if you can come, bring her here. I'll see. So when I examined her, she was ataxic. And I drew the family pedigree. Six siblings, this lady, five have ataxia. Oh. Her mother had ataxia. Her nani had ataxia. And sure enough, they are agarwals. Okay. So, you know, I did the DNA and it's SCA 12. Mm. So, this information, what a family pedigree can give you, nothing else can give you. Agreed, sir. And so, uh, so, so, so many places I find a family pedigree, you know, uh, it's so important uh, that, you know, I, I just can't overemphasize this. So, uh, I think it is worthwhile uh, bringing to the notice of everybody the significant contributions which Dr. Satish Jain has, uh, you know, offered to us. And I'm really proud to be associated. So he was nominated as the nodal resource person from India and Asia for the ILAE, IBE, WHO sponsored global campaign against epilepsy. He was the international uh, uh, ambassador of epilepsy award of International League against epilepsy in 2001. He was nominated to be the Commission for Asian and Oceanian Affairs for the International League Against Epilepsy. 2002, he took premature retirement as a professor and in charge of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Care Program at uh, AIMS in the Department of Neurology. Then he was elected uh, to the Commission for AOC and uh, sorry Asian and Oceanian Affairs for the ILAE. Then he was uh, awarded in 2007 uh, the Fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons at Glasgow. In 2008, he was a convener at the Indian Epilepsy Society Expert Group for Guidelines for Management of Epilepsy in India. And I see him working uh, as a elected president of the Indian Epilepsy Society, the member of the IELAE Task Force on the Classification of Epilepsies in 2014. And I'm really, really, uh, you know, excited to see that he's still working in the year 2002, where he has been nominated to the ILA Task Force for Access to Medicines in the Commission for Medical uh, Therapies. So, uh, sir, do you rate anything else as important as your uh, contribution towards the ILA in terms of its classification, nomenclature, and the drugs? See... <laughs> Uh, I know it's a tough one. I, I did leave the aims prematurely and uh, the certain things I wanted to do there, uh, I couldn't do. But by leaving the aims, I could do certain things which I couldn't have done otherwise. And whatever I have achieved now, uh, you know, not being in an academic institution gave me the liberty to do whatever I want to do. 
I didn't have to take permissions. I didn't need, uh, you know, all those bureaucratic uh, obstacles were not there. So, you know, I could do whatever I want. But then coming up in the ILA, in, in this, uh, this big world, uh, you know, for, for a person from Asia and India was very difficult. And you do face a lot of uh, problems there and uh, people really don't understand what our problems are. And everywhere I had to uh, really, uh, you know, fight it out. And uh, this uh, classification of epilepsy is 2017. Actually, this was supposed to be released in 2013. And there was a, a meeting in Istanbul, uh, you know, where uh, I was also invited. And the uh, whole day we had uh, this discussion. And they wanted to name everything, all the primary generalized epilepsies as genetic generalized epilepsies. And uh, I was insisted, I said, listen, if you do this, there will be havoc in our country. You know, if you use the first word as genetic. Because most of the common epilepsies, we don't even know what they are. They may be a hereditary component, all right. But, you know, no, no, nothing is proved till now. So I took my, uh, you know, I, I, I took a stand. I kept on fighting with them. And this meeting went on from 8 o'clock in the morning till about 7 in the evening. And uh, I was against these 10, 11 people, you know. Then somehow, Emilio Peruca, uh, whom I regard a lot, he understood what I was fighting for. And he said, as the president of the ILE, I put my foot down and this classification which you are proposing does not go further from here. If he's so serious and he has so much reservations about the whole thing, we are going to put the entire classification proposal on the website of the ILA, invite comments, and then review it again. That's how first time such a thing was put in the public domain and people were free to comment. And then it took another four years for the new classification to really come up. So it's been like this uh, most of the times, but yes, uh, it's taught me a lot of things. And uh, I'm more and more convinced that, you know, what I've been fighting for, uh, you know, uh, I need to take a stand on these things. And even on this uh, recent uh, commission on uh, therapies, you know, making access to treatment and all that, promoting all that, there's a big fight going on, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've told them that, listen, we need a position paper on the role of generics. Because if you can get generics, and India is one of the largest producers of generic drugs, then we, that's the easiest way to reduce the treatment gap. And we have to remove all the misconceptions. So they all understand this, but now, uh, at least uh, you know, in that task force, at least there are six, seven people who have agreed to what I'm saying. And, and very soon there is going to be some sort of, again, you know, uh, work, work is going to start on, on either a position paper or some, you know, guidelines or something on the use of generic drugs uh, for epilepsy. And that in my way, you know, uh, India can take a big lead and, uh, you know, the, we, we can really reduce the treatment gap. So uh, yes. it, it's like this, you know, uh, it's head on with people. But uh, most of the people now know that, you know, it's not easy to convince me. And uh, if it is something okay, I get convinced. Otherwise, I keep on fighting. And uh, yeah. nine out of 10, I, I win. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll be sharing certain photographs of your journey with ILAE and epilepsy. Ultra brief comments, sir, because I think it is giving, getting a little heavier. So we need to go on the lighter side of you, like your shirt, which you are wearing. So, <laughs> so the very, very brief comments are the next coming through your photographs, uh, which are going to be. So, this is a stamp, and then this is you standing. So, what was this occasion? Yeah, yeah, this, this, is, is this, this is during the inaugural function of the 18th International League Against Epilepsy. Uh, you know, uh, there was Dr. Maheshwari also, and the then uh, Acting Chief Justice of India who came to inaugurate uh, in this picture. And this was the first time ever, I think, uh, a stamp was released by Government of India. You know, we had concurrently the first the Epilepsy Congress and then we had the World Neurology Congress in 89 uh, in Delhi. All right. So th this was a stamp that was released uh, at that time. 
and uh, this is we were working for the uh, guidelines for epilepsy management which were released during epicon 2008 in delhi and this is dr gauri devi dr saxena my friend who passed away two years back this was the law minister whom i invited to uh, release the guidelines and within nine months we had this uh, little booklet uh, you know we have uh, printed more than 10,000 copies and distributed free of cost so this was the guidelines and i think uh, uh, india is the only country perhaps in, in the developing world and uh, even among most of the developed countries who have guidelines for the use of conventional anti-epileptic drugs and this is the task force on uh, classification of epilepsies uh, you know uh, this is emilio and this is ingrid jackie french and uh, then uh, thompson then this is Moshe and, uh, you know, Sam uh, Vaibe and, of course, myself uh, and this is uh, Samir Zubedi. So, you know, uh, we worked for uh, four years and the, all accepting me, they worked much longer. You know, they worked for almost 70 years for uh, this new classification. So now this Titanic pose is the second question which is going to come in my mind. And who's this uh, beautiful young child in your lap? And what is this place? So now term comes the time about uh, knowing something about uh, you as a person, as your family and uh, your kids and your grandchildren briefly. Well, this Titanic pose is, uh, you know, in India, uh, you know, if you drive from Vizak to Araku Hills, on the way you get this place. And uh, this is where we are during the, uh, you know, we took a day off in the conference in YZ. And uh, this is my grandson, uh, you know, who has set up everything for me today. Uh, he's now 11 and a half. And he's a computer wizard and uh, almost a professional level hacker. So... Oh, my God. <laughs> you said 11 and a half years old? Yeah. He said he can do anything with the computer. <laughs> and uh, this, of course, is Menka. And we. this is, you know, we are uh, driving from... Uh, Gang talk to Darjeeling. And this is, you know, being uh, the, the advisor for healthcare and to government of Sikkim, you know, gave me the opportunity to visit uh, Sikkim and that area uh, quite a few times, you know, officially with a Sarkari Gadi and, uh, you know, red light on top and all those things and a security guard and uh, those kind of things. So, uh, so, where and how did you meet uh, uh, Madam Menka and how did it evolve from there and the marriage and the kids? Any specific memories of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, to I told you that, you know, we, we met on the stage uh, during the play and during our cultural activities and uh, ultimately, you know, we, we tied the knot uh, at a very young age. We were both not even 22 when we got married. And uh, our uh, first child daughter was born in uh, 1980 when, you know, I, I was just about 25 years. And uh, Deepit was born later, uh, you know, when I was doing my DM uh, in Ames. And uh, now we have uh, Nenka as a gynecologist. Uh, she retired from the Indian Railways as uh, uh, equivalent to Joint Secretary Health. Uh, finally, she was in the administration. And uh, we have three grandchildren. Uh, my daughter, Varupi, she is, uh, you know, in, in Stanford, uh, but, but not a doctor. Uh, she works as a communication uh, specialist there. And uh, her husband is a chartered accountant. And uh, uh, they have a daughter, uh, Parina, who is now 14. And uh, with Deepit, we have two grandchildren, uh, of course, this is Tarwar now, who's around 12, and uh, the daughter is uh, six years, uh, Ditya. So that's the family. So uh, now there's a joke about golf. You, you know, when uh, there was a caddy who was standing by this golfer, and suddenly this golfer left his game, and there was a funeral procession passing in front of that golfer. So he left his game, put his head down, and was silenced for about a couple of minutes. So the caddy was really, you know, impressed that this guy must be really liking this person whose uh, funeral is passing by. So the caddy asked the player, uh, uh, sir, I've never seen you leave a golf of game in the last 20 years. So the golfer replied that this is my wife who's going 
and that is why i'm giving her this uh, due which i think she deserves at least a silence of 2 minutes but i can't leave my game so how did golf come to your life and uh, what are your other hobbies apart from golf see golf uh, when i was in aims you know i used to think that uh, you know there's more to life than neurology so there are certain things which i had in my mind uh, that you know i will do the moment uh, you know i have the time and and the resources to do that and one thing was golf uh, mainly because all these are all my school class fellows uh, you know uh, school batchmates uh, you know uh, so uh, almost everyone was playing golf and you know uh, when they used to talk uh, there was a lot of peer pressure on me to at least i picked up some turns but you know then i had to ultimately take coaching classes and all that and then start playing golf and uh, another reason i i started playing golf was because I, I, basically i'm I, i'm a very impatient person restless golf teaches you patience you know golf okay. in golf everything is uh, ulta you know if you hold the you know club tight then you know you can't hit the ball so and if you hold the club straight again it's going to be you know go somewhere else so everything is you know in a in a different way and and west thing is it's like meditation to me golf is like meditation and the effect it has on the body is phenomenal you know you are in a golf course everything is green so beautiful you are with nice people and then if you are playing with friends there's nothing like it and then after a good game you know whatever you do that's okay but then you have a small drink somewhere and and, and you know that's what life is all about so, so i think you are inspiring me enough to look in for golf i have taken up your shirts uh, i have taken up your room i have inherited your attitude in life so i think golf is something which is going to be the next inspiring yes, thing for yes, me for uh, me. you know if if i have to recommend something to you that you take up sure golf would be number 1 on the list so uh, sir you been gone there did that uh, a high achiever in uh, right from the time of your school to your college i think the only uh, exam you might not have passed must have been your dm otherwise you might have been a topper throughout so seeing your journey in life uh, for the last uh, several years so do you have any regrets <laughs> yes uh, this is something do you regret being a doctor that is my first question yes uh, you know initially i used to but uh, you know sometimes now even now i feel that you know i am in the wrong profession and uh, you know uh, many times the, the the society does not really uh, you know give you the respect and the expectations from doctors are uh, totally different you know they, as if we don't have our personal life so sometimes you really feel frustrated you know why you are in this profession you know you could do so many other things in life but whatever it is now that uh, you know i am in uh, this uh, you know you talk of all your achievements and good things that you could do uh, it's it's very important for us to look back uh, at our age and, and see what we couldn't do you know where we went wrong uh, i don't think many people will talk about th these kind of things but one big regret in my life i have is uh, that uh, the 20 21 years I, i spent in aims i had a dream to be uh, to make a, a department uh, you know in aims uh, and, and do certain things and for that you require people and right from day one you know i i i used to pinpoint in my mind look so and so resident deserves to be in aims and there are some residents whom whom i desperately wanted to be in the aims i begged senior people look i see the future in these people and if we have to stay here these people should also be there so for various reasons those people were not selected and now it's okay the institute lost some people but the world has gained they are the top authorities in the world wherever they are so this is one big regret that you know uh, they were not part of the institute you know i, I have a very strong feeling for all in institute second is of course uh, my personal uh, you know what i wanted to uh, build uh, you know an institute a department 
uh, had I continued, uh, the AIMS would have had a very big world-class epilepsy center. It is surprising, you know, I've been visiting AIMS as a patient now. I, I go to the dental center. And the dental center today, believe me, is much bigger than cardiothoracic neurosciences center combined. Those who have not been there must go and see what it is. So there's no reason why we couldn't have had a full-fledged epilepsy center in AIMS, which would be the best in the world. Of course, they are doing good work, yes. But, you know, the, the, these people got all the space. You know, Neurosciences Center could not expand beyond those. So the, the, the many other things that, you know, I had in mind, but okay, uh, it, was, it was not in my destiny. Uh, that's what I realize now. Because despite my best efforts, if I cannot be in a place, I, I'm not destined to be there. Uh, and, and had I been there, uh, maybe there might have been some, some problems also. Uh, so that's one. Second, uh, the biggest regret I have in my life is that, you know, despite both of us being, uh, you know, doctors, we could not convince our children to be doctors. This is for all of us to uh, really introspect. Absolutely. And uh, I can tell you for sure that my daughter, despite being a topper in class 12 boards, uh, she topped the entire Delhi. And in, even in those days, she got 97% marks with the maths and bio both. She said that I will not even take science in my college because if I take science, somehow you will get me into this. So she, she revolted and, and she never wanted to be a doctor at all. My son, of course, had different problems. So he, he was in music and all that. It's different. But I can, I can tell you from my MBBS class fellows, majority of them saw to it that their children become doctors. And they did. Somehow they got them admission into a medical college, whether it's on merit or, uh, you know, the, the other ones. They did post-graduation. They did nursing homes. That children will look after the nursing home. Now, majority of the children of our batchmates today are sitting in U.S. They do not want to come here. They are not going to come here. So we are losing these brilliant people, you know, to... to, to other countries and the government and our profession, they should see to it as to how we can encourage our own children to be doctors. It, it's not a bad profession, it's a good profession. But provided we get the due respect, you know, there are certain professions, there's a guy who passes from IIT. And next day, it's in the news all over. It's got three crore ka package mil gaya. The guy got two crore package and all that, blah, blah, blah. Where is an MBBS student who completes his MBBS? He struggles for the next three, four years for his MD. Then he struggles for the next three, four years for his DM if he, or MCH if he, if he is interested in that. Then he knows that he's on the road. I don't think that they will even get a job of one lakh rupees a month. So at 34, 35 now, despite putting in all the labor, despite having no personal life, neglecting every damn thing, you are still struggling. Things have changed so much. So, you know, this, this, this is very important. I think the Indian Academy of Neurology or uh, Association of Physicians of India or other organizations they should represent, they should be an advocacy group, uh, you know, in our associations that look, we need to sit down with the government, talk to the government, give suggestions as to how we can get our younger people interested in this profession. Otherwise, we'll lose brilliant guys, we'll lose to other countries. They will do well in life wherever they are because they're good, but they're not going to be here. It is sad. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it has been a great evening to spend with you. Um, unfortunately, uh, it would have been better if we were face to face and doing this together. We have had some lovely time with you at dinners and uh, get togethers. Uh, you have been always an awesome, inspiring uh, teacher and uh, an excellent human being to all your students, especially me. I've been your uh, 
followed in several aspects of my life and i will always do it was a pearl of wisdom flowing down from uh, your uh, you know ample experience your rich uh, exposure to life as well as medicine so thank you very much sir for this evening and uh, i take your leave and uh, hope to catch you soon sometime other at uh, some other forum thank you very much thanks subit it was very nice and i thank the indian academy of neurology for giving this opportunity and you know and, and speaking my heart out and i hope someone uh, really uh, you know thinks about the regrets i have in life and and, and as professionals we do something about it and i do hope that uh, we, we meet on the golf course sometime and thank rest you, will be taken care of automatically thank you sir thank you very much to, have a good evening that's the best place to bond together thank you very much sir have a good evening thank bye you. bye thank you.